We are in the outskirts of Bailey, Colorado for our first major training ride. I guess second major training ride of the year, which is the Hundo. It used to be called the Bailey Hundo, now it's just the Hundo. And it's 100K, which is approximately, for this race, it's about 62 to 64 miles, depending on what statistics you look at. Basically, single track mountain bike riding. Uh, the elevation profile is 75-ish, 100 feet. Over the course of that 62-ish miles, we're going to be climbing quite a bit. Um, but also, there's some really cool, fun descending. One of the reasons why Sheree and I are both racing this one is, number one, just to have fun together and get out and camp in the camper and explore, you know, some cool backcountry zones. But also because... I'm doing the Leadville later on this year and a 62 mile ride with some intensity, with some hydration and feeding in it is a really good way to kind of ramp up for the Leadville. The Leadville itself is, I believe, eight weeks. Um, I have one more long ride that's an that's a actual race. Uh, in three weeks and one day. The majority of my training and Shree's training for this race, uh, but my training for the Leadville is on a trainer and it's convenient, you know, if I can't get out or if it's too hot or whatever, I ride on a Garmin, uh, I think it's called a, a Neo bike. I do about three major training rides uh, a year when I train for a bigger race like the Leadville. The first one we did was um, the White Rim in Canyonlands National Park. And we did that in one go, but the way we did it this year was a little different. Um, we ended up only riding about 60 miles each. Doing those long training rides like that, and like this one that we're doing tomorrow, is really important to me because it helps me dial in things like nutrition, things like hydration, and then also it lets me know where I'm at with certain aspects of my training. Am I climbing enough? Do I need to practice going at a faster pace? Stuff like that. The major goal this year is the Leadville, which is August 10th. If you look at it in a macro cycle, <laughs> uh, you know, real early on, I think of this, uh, there's a guy named Stefan Roche that I used to work with with CrossFit. And Stefan had this really cool graph that he would draw he was a university strength and, conditioning, strength and conditioning coach. And what he would say was he used CrossFit for off-season activities. So for example, you know, CrossFit is high in off-season. Sports specific is low in off-season. And then as you approach closer to on-season, those two begin to cross. And then while you're in season, your in-season sport is all, almost all you're doing and your GPP or your CrossFit styles work is very little. So initially when I started in December, December 1st, I was doing a lot of CrossFit. I was doing a lot of sled pushing, stuff that had carry over to the bike, but I was only doing a bike workout three times per week. And I wasn't really terribly worried about how intense it was or if it was really targeted. But now, you know, starting in around March, I'm at four to five days per week on the bike and my uh, CrossFit or strength and conditioning is decreasing rapidly. Now that I'm eight weeks out from the Leadville, it's going to be entirely biking with just the occasional work in the gym. And most of that work is really bike targeted, working on lower leg work and stability, making sure that my back is still strong, making sure that my core is still strong. And also, believe it or not, you know, using your lats and your triceps is really important in biking. So I'm doing a little bit of that. But the majority of it is about 70 to 90 miles per week on a bicycle, which equates to about four and a half to up to 10 hours a week on a bicycle. Right now, it's June 15th. I'm eight weeks out from Leadville and I'm basically only doing gym stuff three days a week. And what that looks like is I do a pressing strength day with accessory work and I do a deadlift strength day with accessory work. And then the only other day is after one of the uh, more intense bike workouts that I do on a trainer, 
I do lower leg stability and explosive work in the gym afterwards. 16 weeks out, I think it's really important. If you have a known date for your event, 16 weeks out, you have to start increasing the volume of that sports specific stuff. So for me, that's being on a bike trainer, that's being out on a mountain bike, that's doing lower leg work and explosive work, but you still have room for GPP, CrossFit, strength work. When you hit 12 weeks, you should be doing a lot more sports specific than you should be doing with the GPP stuff. So really look at that. Let's, if we're gonna use all seven days of a week, look at that as being four days on a bike and three days in, of gym stuff. When you hit eight weeks out, eight weeks, you're doing all gyms. I'm sorry, you're doing all bike stuff, sports specific. There's no need for most of the stuff that you're gonna do in a gym outside of rehab work and then the occasional stability and accessory work that add to the sports specific stuff. My bike workouts right now look like basically three to four days on a bike trainer per week. And I use that Garmin, I think they call it a Neo or something like that. Um, but I bought it this year, it's been fantastic. And I use a app called Trainer Road with that, mostly because they have a track that gets you ready for the Leadville. And I really like that. But in addition to that, I get out twice per week on a, on a mountain bike currently. And like I said, I'm about eight weeks out and that will increase what the bike workouts in, uh, on trails look like is basically 25 miles plus generally zone two targeted. And we're working on fast descents, cornering, all the technical stuff that you need to be fresh with on a mountain bike, but also getting an understanding of how your climbing is, uh, what do I need to address more of, stuff like that. I definitely take a look at uh, the elevation profile of each of those training rides on a mountain bike, and I always try to ramp that up, unless it's kind of like a go out and ride for fun day. On the bike trainer itself, um, the majority of my time up to this point, now that I'm about eight weeks out, has been, which makes sense, base building. So real kind of longer, slower, I'm sorry, faster cadence, but low uh, wattage for longer durations of time. And it's really pretty boring, pretty easy riding, but it doesn't beat you up and you can do a lot of it. That's been the majority of the training up to this point. And after this weekend, on this test ride, I'm going to be doing more sweet spot and VO2 work where you do a really high wattage and then you recover for a period of time and go back up to the high wattage, recover for a period of time. Um, and really what you're tr teaching your body to do is kind of clear fatigue. And they're generally, I'd say like an hour to an hour and a half. The recovery workouts uh, happen about once a week after some of those efforts. And those are generally between 45 minutes and, and an hour and a half. And it's real low, slow intensity. I just basically turn on a, a podcast or turn on YouTube and, and just spin. Man, I'm lucky if I can, I try to train seven days a week, but you know, I still gotta work. And the, the station that I work at right now is pretty brutal. So I'm okay if I don't train one of the two days that I work, I work 48 hour shifts. So if I don't train one of those two days, it's not the end of the world, but I have a bike trainer that I bring this mountain bike with me, take off the back wheel, load it up onto the trainer, and I can continue that same program. <laughs> the, the downside is two things. Number one, I walk around wearing a diaper at the station basically, <laughs> which is pretty embarrassing. But number two, we get interrupted all the time. My two hour workout on a bike trainer or my hour long workout on a bike trainer <laughs> it literally sometimes spans four hours and it just keeps getting interrupted. But you know what? I look at it like I'm doing more than I would have had I not done it and got it, gotten interrupted. So I'm pretty stoked when I get those workouts done. Ah, uh, you know, the, the interesting part about these events and events in general for me personally is that if I'm held accountable to something that's on the calendar, 
I seem to do really well with that. I can focus on training. I, I have dr I'm driven to do well at that event, no matter what it is. If it's just something I'm thinking about doing, generally I don't do it and I feel like a failure. So if I put something on the calendar in writing, it's a goal. And you know, I, I did the, the Leadville in 2019. I didn't know anything about it. I just did it and I took 11.08. <laughs> I mean, it was, I took 15 minute breaks at each of the aid stations. I mean, I could have done so much better, but I just didn't know any different. So uh, I gotta admit, I was really inspired to see Rich. Um, last year I crewed for Rich in, uh, at Leadville and I was really inspired to see him go sub nines. I do look at that as a goal this year. You know, I'd be happy just to PR, honestly, but I think that I'm capable of it um, and I'm training to be capable of it. And either way, I'll, I'm, I'm feeling successful right now because I'm training really hard. I'm not letting off the gas. Days where I don't want to do it, I still do it. I've been eating really well. Um, and I think I've been balancing both training, work, and home life really well for the first time in a lot, probably ever. So it's been fun. Yeah, I wear diapers on, on the call, that's right. Yeah, and by diapers, I'm talking about a bike, <laughs> a bike pad, not, not an actual diaper.